Hello, this is Albert van Dijk, and in this video I want to talk a little bit about model data assimilation. Now, model data assimilation, um, the example I like to use, it's a bit like pouring coffee with one eye. That's to say, um, you can't really do it very well, but you can start doing it, and then um, if you see that you're pouring next to the cup, as this lady does, then you can move your hand and try and get the, uh, the cup under the... Uh, the jug or the jug above the cup, depending on what you adjust, I suppose. Um, so the idea there is that uh, models that we use of, of uh, weather forecasting, for instance, or uh, water resources or, or models like that, uh, they're uh, not perfect. But if we observe the truth as well at the same time, then we can adjust those models to fit the truth and do a better job at predicting what's going to happen next. And that's the whole idea of model data simulation. Um, and uh, I suppose it's important to remember that you know, models are far from perfect. So you might have heard from physics class this idea of let us consider a spherical cow. And this is a very funny movie you can find on YouTube, by the way. Um, but of course, you know, cows are not spherical. And, and so, uh, you know, it, if we use a model in which we assume that the cow is spherical, for instance, because we want to know how much uh, heat it loses, uh, then, uh, then uh, we're making a, a very uh, big simplification, which might be appropriate. But but um, it, it's still the model is still wrong. Um, now what we do with data simulation is realize that a model is too wrong to be uh, as useful as it could be, and so we use data to fix it because um, it's the, the best uh, way at, at, uh, for the purpose uh, or that we or that we can do. Um, so just to give you an example, probably the best developed uh, application, in fact, of, uh, of uh, satellite data simulation is in weather forecasting. You see here some of the immense uh, number of, uh, of uh, observations that goes into our, our weather forecasting models. It's quite extraordinary. So you see a number of satellites there. You see polar orbiting satellites, the geostationary satellites. We've seen those before, but also aircrafts uh, have uh, sensors on them, and those data go into the weather forecasting models. Ships. Uh, have uh, sensors on them, they go into the weather forecast model. Water, weather stations, of course, uh, rain gauges, uh, um, uh, climate stations, and so forth, uh, as well as, uh, as uh, buoys. There's a whole host of buoys out there in the oceans and weather balloons uh, that, uh, that go up into the atmosphere and measure the, the um, uh, state of the atmosphere. So there's an enormous amount of data, and all that gets assimilated into weather forecasting models. So on a map it looks like this. Here you see all the weather stations uh, in, uh, in, in blue and red uh, that uh, are being assimilated. And in, in light blue you see all the ships for one particular time. Uh, you see all the buoys for that time. You see the radio saunas that have been uh, lit up in, in, uh, on, on, on that day, let's say. Uh, you see the, uh, the typical satellite swaths of uh, passive microwave, infrared microwave, uh, geostationary satellite, aircrafts that measure yeah, in the atmosphere, uh, uh, profilers that uh, that have been used, uh, satellite wind from radar and so forth, uh, ozone and radar scatterometers uh, measuring uh, uh, the uh, the state of the of the ocean. So again, an extraordinary array of data that goes into these uh, these models, and so we need some pretty sophisticated methods to bring the models in agreement with those observations. Uh, and we do that with data simulation, and there's different ways of doing it. And uh, you might hear uh, terms like uh, three or forty variational methods, or Kalman filter, Kalman filters, or um, uh, you know, similar sort of uh, terms bandied around. Uh, um, it's a bit too complicated, really, to even try and start explaining here. But basically, what we do is um, conceptually uh, quite simple enough. Uh, we've got the model. Which we propagate with whatever inputs we have, and, we, uh, and we're going to predict that, for instance, the weather, let's say, is going to be like this tomorrow. Uh, uh, when we measure it tomorrow, we realize that the, uh, let's say, this is temperature. The temperature was actually lower than the model that predicted. So we're going to adjust the model, uh, but we're going to keep them to account that the observations aren't perfect either. But, uh, you know, we're going to try and characterize the error in the observations. For instance, the satellite observations are going to say, well. The, uh, the model's wrong, but the observations are not perfect either. So the truth is likely to be somewhere in the middle, and that's where we're going to start uh, uh, continue our model, basically. Then we do the same for the next time step. Then maybe the temperature was, uh, was underestimated uh, compared to the observation. So we're going to adjust the model once again, and so on, and so on. Um, and that's exactly what weather forecasting models do these days. They simulate that whole array of data uh, using equations a bit like this here, uh, which uh, which uh, is uh, is um, 
a bit too complicated to explain, but it's, it's basically, basically matrix algebra. And it's satellite data simulation that gives us uh, the increase in skill in weather forecasts. That's the major factor why our weather forecasts today are much better than they were 20 or 30 years ago. And that's particularly true in the southern hemisphere, because in the northern hemisphere, at least, there's still a lot of ground stations. Uh, but in the southern hemisphere, uh, we don't have nearly as many ground stations. And that's why you see um, the, uh, these two lines here. What we see in blue is the, uh, 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 the uh, uh, let's say, a performance measure of the weather forecast, air pressure in this case, uh, in 1981, you see how the performance increases from, let's say, uh, uh, eight and a half out of, hun uh, out of 10, uh, improves to more than nine and a half out of 10 for the Northern Hemisphere. And if you look at the Southern Hemisphere, the increase is much more impressive and in effect um, is now in just about the same as the, as the weather forecast performance for the Northern Hemisphere. And all that is because of satellites. And then you see that for three days out, five, seven, ten days out forecast. Of course, the forecast quality goes down. Uh, but, you know, one thing you can see here is we have some ability to forecast the weather in ten days' time, whereas, you know, uh, 30, 40 years ago, we really didn't stand a chance. And all that because of satellite data. But it's not just weather forecasting we can, we can use the, the data simulation in. There is an example of hydrology where we're trying to simulate uh, 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 observations from the SCAT satellite, these are radar observations, and observations uh, from m which is a passive microwave satellite. And what we're observing with these satellites is, is the soil moisture of the topsoil. Uh, and our, our model is also predicting that. If I let the model predict, and we call that open loop, so without any observations, we call it an open loop simulation, then we get the gray uh, sort of pattern, you know, the, the, the black line with some uncertainty around it. And as you can see, compared to the observations, which are in uh, white dots here, these are uh, observations on the ground, station observations. You can see, you know, sometimes it, it's, it goes off track quite a lot. And by simulating the satellite observations, then we can get this, this blue band, which is, as you can see, much closer to those observations. Uh, and uh, in this particular case, we wanted to know, uh, is, uh, is the SCAD, is the radar data more useful than the passive microwave data? And the answer was um, that uh, together they're the most useful. And then once you can do that, you can do that assimilation, then you can start reconstructing uh, 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 the sort of uh, uh, soil moisture or river flows, and whatever it is that you're interested in. And so here's an example uh, where we run a data simulation system and we uh, assimilate not only these uh, soil moisture observations, or in fact, in this case, uh, not at all these soil moisture observations. What we're assimilating here is vegetation properties, uh, which tell you something about water use, for instance. Uh, we're assimilating satellite radar data, uh, 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 sorry, satellite rainfall data, uh, and uh, and uh, uh, things like uh, surface reflectance, albedo, and whatnot, uh, open water, and and all those things combined help you to really constrain your model and get a better analysis of uh, what went on in terms of hydrology, or as the case may be, uh, carbon or uh, uh, ecosystem condition. All right. Well, this was a, a brief discussion about data simulation and how it really helps us turn these uh, rather abstract electromagnetic uh, measurements into things that really matter, like how much water is available in the soil.